All right, good morning, afternoon, and evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining today's webinar titled The Impact of Maternal Obesity on Placental Function and Offspring Outcomes, Give Fish a Chance. I'm Maha Sheikh, the Communication Specialist for the Georgia Nutrition Innovation Lab. As more attendees are joining the webinar, I'll begin by going over some of the logistical items. Next, please. I would like to direct all attendees to a few functions on this Zoom call. At the bottom of your screen, you should see a chat icon and a Q&A icon. Please use the chat feature to engage in relevant conversation with the other attendees. Next, please. If you have a question for our speaker, please use the Q&A feature. We have allotted the final 15 minutes of this webinar for Q&A, at which point our speaker will respond to any questions from the audience. If at any point you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please send a message in the chat specifically directed to panelists so that our team can assist you. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our website following the event. We will continue to repeat these technical housekeeping items in the chat throughout the webinar as people may be joining in at later times. Next slide. I would now like to introduce Hanin Abulela, the country coordinator for the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab, who will talk more about the lab and introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Hanin, over to you. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Maha. Um, as Maha said, my name is Hanin Abulayla, and I am the country coordinator for the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab. Uh, I am uh, very uh, thrilled to open our first webinar for this year and very excited to see uh, more people joining and familiar names as well. Before I introduce our uh, moderator for today, I would like to give a brief introduction uh, to the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab project. Uh, so the Jordan, the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab is a research and capacity building program that is funded by USAID Jordan under the Feed the Future uh, initiative. We pursue research and capacity building activities to support the health and nutrition of women of reproductive age, uh, pregnant lactating women and infants and young children in Jordan. Some of our key objectives are implementing a rigorous uh, maternal and child nutrition research agenda, including conducting and analyzing uh, of existing nationally representative data sets and conducting comprehensive evaluations of programs such as USAID's Community Health and Nutrition Program. Moreover, we build uh, individual and institutional capacity uh, through the award of fellowships, scientific symposia, workshops, and webinars. As part of the capacity building activities, recently we have successfully implemented the second research and methods and designs workshop in cooperation with Ministry of Health and USAID. In addition, we conduct these webinars on a regular basis as a means to conduct outreach to a wider stakeholders group in, the out, uh, in and outside Jordan. So uh, for today, this webinar is moderated by Dr. Len. Uh, I would like to introduce Dr. Len. She is the Saqar bin Muhammad Al Qasimi Professor in International Nutrition, as well as a professor at the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University. She has been an active investigator in USAID funded projects in Malawi, Uganda, Nepal, and most recently in Jordan as part of the Jordan Nutrition Innovation Lab. She has been active in experimental studies with humans uh, on lipoprotein responses to several vegetable oils, trans fats, and soy proteins, and the glycemic response as modified by various meal components. Most recently, she has been examining the molecular uh, mechanism of action of um, carotenoids, both pro-vitamin A and non-pro-vitamin A against several chronic diseases. Uh, 
Dr. Lin, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Perry Oterni Ginn. Dr. Oterni Ginn is a research associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology in the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy at Tufts University, and is also the interim director of the Mother Infant Research Institute at Tufts Medical Center. Her overall interest is to understand the effect of the maternal nutritional environment on placental function and fetal nutrient delivery and growth. A self-described perinatal ecologist, Dr. Oterni Ginn is fascinated by the interaction between the mother, baby, and placenta and their environment. Dr. Oterni Ginn's work is founded, funded by the Eunice Kennedy Shriver National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. You can find out more about her work at www.placentascience.com, and she does have a Twitter handle. You put that in the chat. All right, the floor is yours, Perry. Thank you so much, Lynn, and thank you all for inviting me to this webinar, um, give this webinar today. I'm very excited to be here. And I'll be talking to you about our work surrounding the impact of maternal obesity on placental function and offspring outcomes. So to start off with setting the stage here in the US, 29% of women are obese before pregnancy. And um, I understand that the rates in Jordan are similar at 25% of women of reproductive age. And that was back in 2017 to 18, I found that data. So it may be higher now. This map of the US shows by state the rates of pre-pregnancy obesity, which can be higher in some states than another. And the colors represent the increase in um, these rates of obesity in a three-year time span between 2016 and 19. So some of these increases are over 14%. So this is a very um, important current problem that is growing. The reason that we're concerned about it is that the outcomes for women who come into pregnancy obese are poor and higher risks for both them and their offspring. And looking at cardiometabolic disease risk in the offspring, which is what we're interested in in our lab, this risk is present at birth in offspring of women with obesity. So in the yellow circles, we show that at birth, offspring of patients with obesity during pregnancy, they have higher leptin levels, which is a marker of fat mass in the infant. They have higher levels of this ratio HOMA IR, which is representative of insulin resistance. So they are born already with a higher level of insulin resistance, higher inflammatory cytokines in their circulation. And some studies have shown changes in their lipid profile that are consistent with cardiometabolic um, risk. In later in life, in the red circles, we see an increase in all-cause mortality and specifically cardiovascular disease mortality if um, adults had uh, experienced obesity in utero. And what's interesting is that typically there's a higher risk for male offspring than female offspring with obesity in pregnancy. So what is it about obesity and pregnancy that it has these impacts? And because obesity is associated with so many different um, variables, such as insulin resistance, oxidative stress, inflammation, differences in diet, dyslipidemia, and even increases in vascular reactivity in the mother, it can be difficult to tease out these different factors and which one is most important beyond just having a high BMI in pregnancy. And oops, in our lab, we're really focused on maternal um, lipids, lipid transfer across the placenta and lipid delivery to the fetus. And I'll be talking about that more. So maternal BMI is, um, this is a secondary analysis of a study looking at, back in 20 years ago now, looking at um, lipids in the mother and baby during pregnancy. And they did a post hoc analysis um, that found that there's a 
negative correlation between pre-pregnancy BMI of the mother and umbilical cord DHA levels. And the reason that we're caring about DHA is it's significant as an omega-3 long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid, which is an essential fatty acid during the pregnancy that's critical for fetal neurodevelopment. And so I found this very interesting because even though women in this study were not clinically obese, meaning they don't have a BMI of over 30, but what would happen in obese women would these levels continue to decline? And given that one in four women or almost one in three now are obese before pregnancy, that could have implications for long-term outcomes of the baby. And so this is demonstrated um, that omega-3s are so important for fetal outcomes is another earlier study in rats. Now, this was a model, a rat model of deficiency in the essential fatty acids during pregnancy. So what they had here is that pregnant rats were placed on a diet deficient in um, omega-3 fatty acids versus a control diet in pregnancy. And then after weaning, their offspring were either kept on that same diet that they were exposed to in utero or switched to um, the alternate diet. And what they found is that mean arterial pressure in the adult offspring was highest in the offspring that were exposed to an omega-3 deficient diet during pregnancy and post weaning. Lowest in ones that had, a, a, had the normal levels of omega-3 um, in their diet. And then there was uh, also a risk of high mean arterial pressure in offspring that were exposed to that deficient diet in pregnancy, even though that they were switched to a control diet for most of their adult life. So the conclusion from this was that the early perinatal omega-3 status profoundly affects adult physiology. And other studies have found that in addition to hypertension, essential fatty acid deficiency in utero can expose the offspring to higher risks of vascular dysfunction, insulin resistance and diabetes and obesity later in life. And that's just the cardiometabolic consequences. There's also neurodevelopmental consequences. So clearly the fatty acids profile that fatty acids that are um, in the maternal diet and transported to the fetus are critical in pregnancy with the fetus sees, but what is it that controls fetal fatty acid delivery? And this is what we're very interested in our lab. So firstly, this is here, we have a picture of a placenta in cross-section. This is a human placenta. Um, and here we've blown up this area of the placenta called the villi, and they are, which are doing the hard work of nutrient transport. So they're exploding in maternal blood in pregnancy. And here's the maternal blood here. This is the trophoblast layer, which is the key um, nutrient transporting cell of the placenta. And so nutrients have to get from maternal blood across the trophoblast into the fetal vasculature. And this is a fetal capillary here. So the first thing that can control how much fatty acid is delivered to a fetus is maternal supply. And so we have our little fatty acids here uh, in yellow in the maternal circulation. Then they are taken up, they have to cross into the trophoblast, and here they can be metabolized or stored. Then also they can be eventually or immediately transported into the fetal circulation. So at each one of these steps, there's this opportunity for some regulation of fatty acid delivery. And now we'll talk about what the impact of maternal obesity is on this pathway. So placental fatty acid uptake in here is a schematic of a trophoblast. And in fact, the trophoblast is a syncytium that's one layer facing the maternal blood, but this is just showing it as a single cell. So there are these multiple types of fatty acid transporters that are present on the maternal facing membrane of the trophoblast, along with lipases. And so maternal triglycerides, which are the main source of fatty acids to be transferred to the fetus in pregnancy, 
are broken down by these lipases to release the free fatty acids, which are which are actually taken across um, the placenta. So those free fatty acids bind to various isoforms of fatty acid transporters within the uh, maternal facing membrane and are taken up into the trophoblast where they bind to these cytosolic binding proteins that then traffic them throughout the cell to different cellular fates. So they can be metabolized into eicosanoids. Um, they can be esterified and stored as lipids or built into the plasma membrane as phospholipids. And they can be oxidized and used for energy. Also, some of them, and not as many as we thought, are actually taken across to the fetus um, unmodified. So what happens in the setting of maternal obesity? We thought many years ago, about 10 years ago, there was a lot of interest in measuring fatty acid transporters in the placenta to see how they're impacted by maternal obesity. And what we found was surprising. Many of them are actually decreased in the setting of obesity. And in fact, overall fatty acid uptake in the placenta is actually lower in patients with obesity and diabetes. And that is consistent with the lower levels of fatty acid transporters and binding proteins in the human condition. And interestingly, the stars here represent that many of these decreases and changes in fatty acid transporters are mainly are, or are greater in males. Again, there's a sex difference in response to the maternal environment. But when we look at, and this is, these are immunohistochemical stains of fatty acid transporters in the human term placenta from our lab. And so the dark color is really these, these transporter uh, the positive stain. And when we look at where they are located in the trophoblast, but these are high, high levels of staining that we see. So there are so many fatty acid transporters that even a 20 to 30% decrease in transporter levels are unlikely to really impact um, uptake. And it's, we believe that these impairments in uptake are unlikely driven solely by these fatty acid transporter levels change because they're so um, highly expressed. So just to summarize that bit, fatty acid transporters or uptake are generally lower in placentas of obese patients and transporter levels are very high in the trophoblast layer suggesting that uptake regulation of this structure may be limited. So after the fatty acids are taken up into the placenta, what happens to these lipids? And this is where we'll talk about our recent work in fatty acid metabolism. First of all, it's important to realize that the placenta actually does metabolize fatty acids and use them for energy. And the reason it's important is because for a long time in our field, it was believed the placenta only used glucose for energy and didn't use fatty acids, but in fact it does. It's known that it oxidizes fatty acids even in the presence of glucose, and this oxidation likely drives fatty acid uptake rates. The reason that they learn this is by studying fetuses with a fatty acid oxidation disorder. And those fetuses also have placentas with a fatty acid oxidation disorder. And what they found is that these placentas, they, they experienced placental insufficiency due to low ATP production because the placenta was unable to oxidize fatty acids. And this led to fetal growth restriction and prematurity in these pregnancies. So from this, we realized that placental fatty acid oxidation is critical for proper development of the fetal placental unit and health of the mother. In addition to oxidation of fatty acids, fatty acids are esterified and stored in the placenta. This esterification protects the trophoblast from lipotoxicity. So we don't have a lot of fatty acids floating around in the cell causing inflammation and oxidative stress as they react with other molecules, which is what lipotoxicity is. Leading uh, fatty acid esterification also leads to the synthesis of phospholipids or structural lipids that help build membranes and triglycerides, which are the storage form of these lipids in the placenta. The placenta also has lipid droplets, and I'll show you a picture of those in a, in a few slides, which are sensitive to maternal nutrition and diet. And this may be an essential intermediate step between uptake into the placenta and delivery to the fetus. 
And these placental lipid pools are likely key to fatty acid transfer dynamics. So the metabolism fatty acids in the placenta are actually really important for their delivery to the fetus. Now, we um, published a few years ago now in endocrinology, a paper where we characterize the impact of maternal obesity on placental lipid metabolism pathways. And I'm gonna walk you through some of the highlights from that paper in the next few slides but I've, I've put the reference and you're free to read, get into the nitty gritty details. So the first thing that we found is that markers of mitochondrial number and function in placentas of patients with obesity were lower. We also found this consistent with markers of fatty acid oxidation pathway and uh, particularly in the mitochondria. So beta oxidation of fatty acids, many of the um, key pathways that regulate this were decreased in placentas of obese women. And PPAR alpha, which is a, in other tissues, had been found prior to this to be a key regulator of lipid metabolism pathways, we also found to be decreased. When we looked at overall rates of oxidation, and so we did this by using a radio-labeled tracer fatty acid, we used palmitic acid as an example fatty acid, and looked at it in primary human placental explants isolated from women with and without obesity in pregnancy. We actually didn't find an overall change in fatty acid oxidation activity um, in these placentas, and that was surprising considering some of the markers that we saw were lower. When we look at how fatty acids are oxidized within a cell, they can be go through beta oxidation within the mitochondria, which is the main, um, the main way of ox uh, being oxidized, or they can also be partially oxidized in peroxisomes. And in other tissues in the setting of obesity, peroxisomal oxidation is usually upregulated because there's more fatty acids in the cell. So what we did to test what the contribution of these two organelles were to this overall fatty acid oxidation, and if that changed with obesity, we used edamoxir, which is a specific antagonist of CPT1, the rate-limiting step of beta oxidation in the mitochondria. So in the setting of edamoxir, CPT1 would be blocked, and fatty acids would be forced to be partially, at least, oxidized in the peroxisome, shortened so that they could diffuse into the mitochondria. So with edamoxir, we actually then could see the difference in oxidation in these placentas in that this sort of uncovered the peroxisomal component because it knocked out the mitochondria. And what we see is that patients with obesity have a much greater rate of peroxisomal fat oxidation in their placenta. The importance of this is that it compensates for the lower mitochondrial oxidation and overall um, we are able to maintain fat oxidation in the placenta. It just shows you the beauty of how dynamic the placenta is uh, to maintain fetal growth. In terms of esterification and storage of lipids, esterification rates were increased in placentas of obese women, and that was consistent with an overall increase in lipid content in the placenta. This also was consistent with an overall increase in the gene expression and protein expression of multiple markers um, and key steps in fatty acid esterification pathways. And if you want to know what lipid droplets in a placenta look like, this is a cross-section of a human um, placenta at term. Red is the trophoblast layer, blue is the, the uh, nuclei, and in green, is the stain for perilipin 2, which is a marker of lipid droplets. And you can see these little lipid droplets all throughout this placenta from an obese patient. So as a summary of all that, we found that mitochondrial beta oxidation and number were lower with obesity and peroxisomal oxidation, fat esterification and total lipid content were high. And that's said again here, and so um, overall fat oxidation was maintained because of the increases in peroxisomal beta oxidation, but esterification and storage pathways were increased in these placentas. So what is the impact of all this for fetal growth? And these studies came out by um, a group in Austria a few years ago, looking uh, using human placentas 
isolated perfused um, human placentas, which is the gold standard for transport experiments in humans. And so what they found is that using stable isotope labeled fatty acids ac diffusing across the human placenta, um, that actually only 6% of labeled fatty acids are transported to the fetal circulation intact. And through modeling, they found that actually it's the metabolism of the fatty acids that explain the difference between uptake and transport to the fetus. And um, that these rates of metabolism actually drive the rates of uptake. And in a follow-up paper that came out well, just a couple of years ago, they looked at um, the same model. They used the perfused human placenta model, placentas from both patients with and without obesity to look at the differences in transfer and um, metabolism. And focusing in on their results in DHA, our omega-3 fatty acid that is so important for fetal development, they found that the de there was a decrease in DHA mobilization from the metabolic pools in the placenta with obesity. And this resulted in lower DHA levels in the fetal circulation. So their conclusion was that these placental pools of lipids was really key to the transfer dynamics. So how the placenta metabolizes, but also stores these lipids is really important for what's released to the fetus. And so we asked the question, now we know that it's very important how the placenta metabolizes fatty acids for what the baby sees and potentially fetal growth. So can we modify this? And one of the papers that we looked at here or that we published was a secondary analysis of a randomized control trial of um, fish oil supplementation in overweight and obese women from, that collaborators had done. And so we studied the placentas of these um, the patients from these trials and looked at their uh, lipid metabolism pathways. What we found, first of all, and it was incredibly obvious when you look at the mass spec data, is that all of the, uh, is that the total lipid content in placentas of women who were randomized to a fish oil supplement was 30% lower than overweight or obese women that were randomized to the placebo. And so here, N3 fatty acid indicates an omega-3 fatty acid or fish oil group. And this was consistent with changes in their um, lipid metabolism gene pathways. So I'm showing here DGAT1, which is the rate-limiting step in triglyceride synthesis. And so therefore, esterification and storage of lipids in the placenta. And DGAT1 expression is negatively correlated with the change in maternal DHA levels during the trial. So from, from before randomization to late pregnancy, this, the women who were randomized to fish oil tended to have a greater in, an increase in DHA levels in their blood. And this change in DHA was associated with changes in the gene expression in these fatty acid metabolism pathways. So the take home message from that is the placenta is extremely sensitive to omega-3 fatty acids in the mother and to fish oil supplementation. But we saw we weren't able to detect an effect on fatty acid oxidation pathways in, um, these, in this study. So what was the effect on the fetus from, um, from this randomization? And this was a paper that came out a couple of years ago um, in nutrients. And what they showed was that though neonatal fat mass was not impacted by um, maternal randomization to fish oil, they did find that there was an increase in lean body mass in um, women who were in offspring of women who were randomized to omega-3 fatty acids. When they did then further stratification analyses, they found that the effect of fish oil on fat-free mass of the babies was strongest in the patients with the highest BMI, patients with a high omega-6 to omega-3 dietary intake, or those that had the lowest omega-3 to begin with, and those with male offspring. So again, we see sex differences here in their sensitivity to this intervention. So to summarize that, placental fatty acid storage and esterification pathways are sensitive to maternal omega-3 levels, 
it's unclear how these changes in placental lipid metabolism, at least in this small trial, affected fetal fat accrual. But what's interesting is that supplementation for logistical reasons didn't start until 14 to 16 weeks of pregnancy, so early second trimester. And what if this is too late? And so we just published a paper last fall in Scientific Reports where we observed and characterized the changes in the first trimester placenta of lipid metabolism pathways in patients with and without obesity. And to summarize that, we found that the placental transcriptome is already different between patients with and without obesity um, by the first trimester. This is showing um, a volcano plot of targeted analysis of multiple, I think we did 40 fatty acid metabolism genes. And you can see in red, all of the genes that were differentially expressed between patients with and without obesity in their placenta in early pregnancy. And what's interesting is that um, the ranges of uh, these samples were from six to 14 weeks of pregnancy, an average of 10 weeks. So as early as six weeks of pregnancy, we see these differences in gene expression pathways and lipid metabolism um, in patients with obesity. So the placenta is sensitive very early in pregnancy. We already see these changes. The number one affected pathway we saw, we detected was PPAR alpha. And if you remember PPAR alpha from our earlier results in full-term uh, placentas, it is a master regulator of fatty acid oxidation. So is it also that regulating that um, in the early first trimester? We showed that it was by using explants from first trimester placentas and um, an antagonist to PPAR alpha, GW6471. And what we found that is in exposure to this antagonist for 24 hours, there was a 50% decrease in the ability of the, the first trimester placenta to oxidize fatty acids um, and no change in fatty acid esterification. So it's very important pathway even in early pregnancy and it's impacted by obesity. Now there's some hope in that when we, and this is unpublished data here, but when we expose these explants, either at first trimester or full-term explants to omega-3 fatty acids, both DHA and EPA, it's sister fatty acid, we find that there's an increase in PPAR alpha levels in these um, explants. So there is some um, optimism that there could be an intervention that is, um, in early pregnancy would be impacting this lipid metabolism pathway and potentially improving some outcomes. We also looked at besides PPAR alpha, other genes in um, the fatty acid metabolism pathway in response to exposure to omega-3 fatty acids in vitro and found the yellow arrows show that many of the changes that we see with obesity are reversed when they're exposed to omega-3 fatty acids for 24 hours in vitro. So again, there is some optimism for a potential intervention. But it also brought to mind, because of these changes are present already in early pregnancy, what might be the effect of a high omega-3 environment um, where patients are constantly having diets or having diets already preconception that are high in omega-3s? And so for that, we worked with collaborators in Hawaii and the reason that we went to, or we didn't go to Hawaii, sadly, but we work with collaborators in Hawaii is because that patients in Hawaii or people in Hawaii have a much greater fish consumption than do patients in Ohio, which is where our previous studies were done in cohorts in Ohio. And when we looked at placentas that were collected um, in patients from Hawaii, and they were collected at the same time and in the same fashion as the way we had done it in Ohio, because we used the same protocol. Um, the first thing we did to really look at maternal DHA levels uh, were to, to assess maternal DHA levels, were to look at them at the time of a scheduled cesarean section. So they were all fasting in um, mothers with and without obesity in Hawaii. And what we found is that there was some decrease with obesity in maternal DHA levels, 
But when compared to our patients from our Ohio cohorts, the maternal omega uh, DHA levels were tenfold higher. And so there was much, even with obesity, a much greater um, exposure to DHA in, um, in pregnant women in Hawaii. And so we hypothesized that this chronically high maternal omega-3 level may suppress the effects of maternal obesity on placental lipid metabolism based on our earlier work in, uh, with our supplementation trial. And in fact, what we found is we looked at all different kinds of pathways, and I'm just going to show total lipid content because it's very sensitive to DHA. And what we found is that in patients in Hawaii or a high omega fish intake area, lipid content is not different with maternal obesity in the placenta. And to remind you of what it looked like in our other cohorts in a low omega fish eating area or fish eating area, there was a much greater increase in lipid content in the placenta with maternal obesity. Fetal growth in, uh, was not different in terms of birth weight between the two cohorts with and without maternal obesity. But when we look at a marker of fat mass, um, we used cord leptin levels. So this is umbilical cord leptin, which is a marker of fat mass in the fetus. And in our Ohio cohort, there was a much greater level of cord leptin in offspring of women with obesity. Whereas in our Hawaiian cohort, there was no difference. Um, even though the rates of obesity were the, you know, were the same between these two um, cohorts. So this is very interesting and, and suggests that there may be some um, cardiometabolic differences um, in terms of with offspring in terms of maternal obesity effects in these two environments. So summarizing this section, high omega-3 levels in mothers may suppress the effect of maternal obesity on placental lipid metabolism. And I think the key takeaway is that the nutritional environment is a critical consideration when studying the effects of obesity in different cohorts. We also saw that lower neonatal leptin, a marker of fat mass in offspring of obese patients in Hawaii compared to Ohio, may suggest a reduced fat accrual in utero. And so altogether, summarizing this work, the maternal environment and diet can impact placental function and fetal growth. And the placenta can mediate many of these impacts. And our studies really highlight potential nutritional interventions that could improve outcomes, which may be mediated by changes in placental nutrient metabolism. And therefore, we have an opportunity for intervention to mitigate the vicious cycle of intergenerational obesity that we see. But many questions remain. How changes in placental lipid metabolism may affect placental function and fetal fat deposition. We're working on that. Uh, the impact of chronic omega-3 consumption modifies the effect of maternal obesity on metabolic pathways, but we're not sure how. We're not, we don't know if whole fish versus supplements are equally beneficial and do all patients benefit. And what is the role of the maternal metabolic environment in early pregnancy on these outcomes? We've started to publish on that, but these, they do suggest that our interventions are starting too late. And so wrapping up, I wanted to thank my lab um, who have of course done this, the hard work and my collaborators here, which have shown a lot of our uh, joint efforts um, direct you to follow us on Twitter if you like and check out our website. And of course, thanking our funders, which is the NICHD. Um, and so happy to take questions and have a discussion around these topics. Thank you very much for that <laughs> excellent summary. And it appears there is still a lot of work to do. That's great. Um, let's see if we have questions from the audience. No. All right. Uh, from Tatiana Elcor, who's a one graduate of Tufts and um, is a dietitian and has a PhD, she asks, "Could you please explain further about the intergenerational difference 
And could you also clarify whether you suggest that recommendations for fish oil supplementation should be different if a pregnant woman is bearing a boy versus a girl? So there's a big there's question. two questions there. Yes. <laughs> so um, we don't know enough about the, um, the studies have shown. Let's put it this way that male offspring are more sensitive to the maternal environment and diet and pregnancy, and that potentially from some of the stratified analyses that I showed there from the Monte Dreze paper, which is in a small number of patients, um, but potentially they may benefit more from an omega-3 supplement um, of the mother. That said, I can't make any recommendations about whether um, a woman carrying a boy should supplement versus a woman carrying a girl. We, we're not there yet with the data, but they are intriguing and suggest that there may be some sex differences in the benefits to them. But I do think that a lot more work has to be done on what populations um, would benefit the most. It does seem in general speaking that patients with uh, that come in with some cardiometabolic risks with obesity, who have a low fish intake already in pregnancy, would benefit more or may see greater effects than those um, who already have a high omega-3 intake. So that, that we can say from the data. Um, and I think her first question was about the intergenerational effects. So yes. my last slide was suggesting, and I didn't have time to dig into it too much, but what we know from our work, and this has been work that's been ongoing for decades now, is that the maternal environment and pregnancy and what the baby is exposed to during development can have long-term implications on their health. What we also have shown, or not we, but I mean the collective we, not my lab, but work has been done um, by Kelly Moley's group that, and you can look up her papers, I don't have one handy to share in the chat, but she worked looking at the effect of maternal obesity on ovarian um, and um, egg mitochondrial function. Okay, so there were impairments in the oocytes of women with obesity. What's interesting about that, and they've shown this in rodent models as well, is that in rodent models, that of course the mitochondria from the oocyte is then that phenotype is transferred to female offspring. Those female offspring can also transfer that risk to their offspring. So there's an intergenerational component or transgenerational component of obesity that can be passed down through mitochondria and po probably epigenetic effects which we're only starting to understand, but there are some really beautiful papers about that out there that I would, um, I should have come up with some references to share, but we can, you can look it up, uh, Kelly Moley's work. Right, thank you very much. We have another question from Rola Abu Dawood. What could be the reason behind the fact that male fetuses are affected differently than female fetuses in obese mothers? Could it be related to the mitochondria? It could be um, related to the mitochondria. <clears throat> I think a lot of these things might be passed down through the mitochondria. Um, and I just had kind of talked about that. But in terms of the male-female differences, it's very interesting. Um, the placentas of male versus female babies are very different. And, um, and by very different, I mean, they do the same thing generally, but they respond differently to changes in the environment and to stresses during pregnancy. I actually wrote a commentary, and if I have time later, I will try to pull it up and share it in the chat about, um, it was called Let's Talk About Sex, and it was in uh, JCEM, Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. And it was, a, it was just a commentary on a paper that was published there. But I go through um, some of the data for um, placental sex differences, in, and I can summarize it here. So what's really interesting is they've known this for 
hundreds of years that boys and girls grow differently in utero. And recent data, and I mean recent data in the last 20 years, has shown that that may be due to placental factors. So what we can say, I can say generally, is that a male fetus grows a smaller, more efficient placenta. So the placenta tends to be itself smaller. The male will sacrifice placental growth to have more energy for their somatic growth. Whereas a female baby will grow a larger placenta and they themselves will be a little bit on the smaller side. So they have more capacity if there is an issue in pregnancy, um, say dietary um, deficiencies or maternal hypertension or all sorts of things that can happen in pregnancy, the female baby tends to do a little bit better because they have a placenta that is more, can compensate better um, for these deficiencies in their environment. And you can actually see this. I've had NICU nurses come up to me after talks and say, I see this all the time. Male babies tend to be a little more vulnerable and tend to do more poorly um, in the NICU because they've, been, they've all been exposed, these babies, of course, to um, challenges in development. And the female babies tend to be a little bit more, um, they tend to do a little bit better. So we think that that begins with, um, there's some evidence at least that that begins with the placenta and how it develops in utero. It's very interesting. All right, thank you. Now a question from Dr. Rima Safadi. Was there any difference between women taking supplements versus those who consume fish naturally? Mm, that's a, such a great question. And we're really curious about that. In, in the secondary analysis we did of that, that smaller study, um, there was very low fish eating in our population. And um, so we were basically able to, and of course we used maternal DHA levels, which would be affected by both things um, as um, another variable that we looked at. So we don't know in that cohort, and it's a small cohort to be able to put, um, pull those two things out. We would like to do um, and have, I've been planning to do this with collaborators is a study, a three-arm study where we look at, you know, placebo and then patients who are a randomized to whole fish and patients who are randomized to a fish oil supplement. And that's really the kind of study that needs to be done to, to answer that question that's well-powered, which is very difficult and expensive to do, of course, but that's really what's the question. I think if you were to ask me to hypothesize I believe that fish eating whole fish would be the most beneficial because it would come along with micronutrients um, that are important for also for development, such as choline and iron, but um, and that can also support choline is, is important for supporting um, omega-3 transport across the placenta, actually. So um, that that comes along with fish and and um, sort of a balanced diet is what's probably really the most beneficial. Um, and also with a whole food, you replace other foods um, rather than a supplement that just adds to a diet. So that can be beneficial as well. Thank you. We have a question from uh, Hattie Crooks. What about women who are obese, not before, but during pregnancy, are the risks the same? Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so the, the, we find the highest risk are women who come into pregnancy with obesity. Um, those that gain a lot of weight during pregnancy so that they fall into a clinically obese category at the end of pregnancy, actually it's the lean women that tend to gain more weight in pregnancy than obese women. Um, we do have IOM guidelines that have been, or Institute of Medicine guidelines in the US that are written to um, to recommend certain amounts of weight gain in pregnancy. And they, those recommendations vary for women that start off with different BMIs. So it's not the same. Um, the reason is, is because weight gain in pregnancy, though there is, um, 
you do gain fat mass, a lot of it is water. And so, um, and, and most of it is lost. Though having said that, women who gain a lot of weight and ex excess weight, so that in excess of recommendations, it does tend to be they gain more fat. And that is harder to lose post-pregnancy. Um, and so women, that's why there is a, um, there is a correlation between the number of children you've had and your weight, because it, you know, it gets harder to lose that weight. Um, and then you end up, that's a risk for obesity, in fact, is that you start, you know, coming into the next pregnancy heavier. Um, so that is, that's the main risk with uh, uh, the increases in gestational weight gain. But it is, it's, it's more risky to start pregnancy obese. All right, thank you. Now a question from Rada Albandak. Do you think that intake of junk food may contribute to lipid oxidation, especially if it is fried food for a long time? For example, fish fillets offered in fast foods. Yeah, that's a great question. So how you prepare your fish. Um, right now, the recommendations are two to three servings a week for women in pregnancy, which most women don't even get that. Um, but if you're having all fried food and fried fish, is that as healthy? Well, it's probably not as healthy because you're adding things to it um, that are, 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 you know, adding excess calories. However, is, um, do, I think the other part sort of side to that question is, do these other fatty fats these maybe less desirable or more saturated fats, do they impact these pathways? I think that's a great question. What we do know is that um, my, my focus has been on the omega-3s because that's so low in people's diet that adding them, you know, you tend to sort of looking at that response of the placenta. But we do know that saturated fatty acids such as um, steric acid and high, high levels of palmitic acid will induce inflammation and um, um, increases in lipid droplets in the placenta and some of that. So it'll induce backing up a little bit. So those saturated fatty acids will induce inflammatory pathways in the placenta that can be problematic um, for placental function and oxidative stress. They, any excess lipid will do that. Actually, if you have too much DHA and put it on the placenta, it'll do that too but the saturated fatty acids tend to do it at a lower level. You can actually in, inhibit their effects on inflammation by adding omega-3s to that. So <laughs> if you were only eating fried foods um, that are high in saturated fatty acids without omega-3s, it would be problematic for the placenta and also other, uh, other things. But if you add fish to that, you may be able to mitigate some of those effects. That's a roundabout way of kind of answering that question. All right, thank you. From Judy Kanahuati, in the fish eating population, and I was thinking Hawaii, but um, how frequently do they eat fish? Free pregnancy advice in the US says to eat fish no more than twice a week. Hmm. So um, I can share, maybe I can share the FDA guidelines um, after this. I, I'm having trouble with my screens, but. Um, it's two to three servings a week for pregnancy in, in the U.S. In, um, before pregnancy, still, most, most people don't eat enough fish. Um, and I think a lot of that is started with fears with um, mercury contamination. There are fish that are safer to eat in pregnancy than others, and there are ones to avoid, such as swordfish and shark. Um, but canned tuna and salmon are safe to eat in pregnancy. So um, I may have lost the thread of exactly what the question was, Lynn, but um, I, it was how many, oh, how much do um, people in Hawaii eat? Well, I, well, I put the Hawaii part in. Yeah, um, yeah. So, yes, so in the high yeah. fish take, so, okay. So in a high fish eating population, such as Hawaii, Japan is another one. Um, the fish intake, and I think I have it on that slide, although I have to remind myself of exactly what it was, but it was like, Oh, you know, 40 or 50% higher. Um, and that's an average. But what my colleagues have told me is that 
there's like sushi on in every corner store in Hawaii. So it's just a almost a daily part of people's lives. And I think that's one of the big differences here. We have to think about it and say, I've got to eat two to three servings a week in some of the, in places where it's just really readily available and um, easy for people to access and probably cheaper because you don't have to, doesn't have to be trucked in as far. Um, fresh fish is just part of the culture. And so it's more of a daily intake um, or at least much more than um, what we would be doing in, in our Ohio cohort or even here in Boston. Oh, Lynn, you're, you're muted. Mm, thank you. A question from Noel Solomons, um, a colleague here at Tufts. How do you ethically access human placental tissue in early pregnancy or at any point other than a C-section or postpartum? Um, well, these are from the, for our first pregnancy tissues were all from women who have, um, who had come in to the clinic for an elective uh, abortion. And so they had already um, decided to do this and they had um, consented to that clinically. And then they come to the clinic for their procedure. And at that point, we approach them to see if they're interested in talking about research. And, um, and many of them are very happy to donate their tissues for our research. So it's all done with informed consent, IRB approved. All right, from Dhananjaya um, Hudyal, what is the relation between physical works and pregnancy? Um, so physical activity? Um, I'm and, not sure, I've just read what the- um, Yeah, I'll, I'll, I, I, if, so talking about there, there are important impacts of physical activity on the placenta and pregnancy health. So physical activity is recommended in pregnancy. Um, and as, as you are able and comfortable, you know, not necessarily running marathons, although some pregnant women do do that. Um, and in fact, it's important for, um, it's important for mothers to remain physically active, at least with moderate activity. Um, it does have effects on the placenta. There are groups that are looking at the effect of physical activity on placental function and nutrient transport pathways. And they do see that, you know, the differences between women with low physical activity in pregnancy versus high physical activity. There's some um, potentially beneficial impacts on um, increasing, you know, some of our amino acid transporters. So you have babies with a higher fat-free mass and lower in their fatty acid transporters. Um, so I think more work needs to be done on that, of course, but um, definitely it's, it's a, a positive effect on outcomes. All right, I'm going to ask the question that might be asked by any of the um, pediatricians or neonatologists in the audience. If somebody comes to you reporting that they're pregnant, maybe in the late first trimester and they're grossly overweight, what do you advise them to do? Mm. So I think this is a tricky question. Um, I'm not an obstetrician, but I have obstetric colleagues who have to, who work with um, patients that they can see late on in pregnancy. And that's, that's difficult because many of these processes are, are sort of already going. Um, I think that what clinically is recommended is a balanced Mediterranean diet. If someone is already at a very high BMI or has gained excess amounts of weight, if they're a very high BMI and they're within the weight gain um, recommendations from the IOM, because we don't recommend that women lose weight in pregnancy, um, it is important for some weight gain in pregnancy because a lot of that weight is the fetus and the placenta. So. Um, I think managing their weight within guidelines and making sure that women are having a healthy, balanced diet and getting their two to three servings of fish a week and supporting patients, because this is very difficult 
um, and women want to be healthy in pregnancy. So that is where we all come at that with a, you know, a positive outlook moving forward. Okay, thank you. I think we have come to the end of our allotted time. I'd like to thank Dr. Perry O'Turn again for this fabulous seminar. And she has given us enough evidence um, that diet is important during pregnancy and also overweight and obesity. And I think it will be up to um, those in the audience to figure out how to put uh, these ideas into action in order to uh, mediate some of these problems. And with that, I will um, say goodbye, I guess. And thank you all very, very much. And thanks everyone for listening and tuning in today. This is really fabulous discussion. Honored to be here. <laughs>